talk on the Perthes disease. This is one of the common disease or the common case would be kept in exam. So I will include some of the theoretical topic as well as the practical topics. These are the broad headings I'm going to cover today. Definition that is also very, very important. What is actually the Perthes disease? When we can diagnose by in a clinical scenario, in a clinical features, the natural history or the natural evolution of the Perthes disease, the radiology and the classification. Many times it was asked in past by the many examiner, what are the radiological features of Perthes and common classification for Perthes? Uh, what are the main goal of treating the Perthes disease? and various principle of management, whether it is preventive, co corrective, or salvage intervention. First of all, how the Perthes disease name has come. Actually, there are the three different scientists from three different world, three different countries, Germany, France, and USA. 110 years back, they came with the same disease after evolution of X-ray. So basically, it, it is the Arthur Legg, Jackis Kaus, and George Perthes. So actual name is Leg Cow Perthes disease because of the last name of all three authors. But in short, it will be called as the Perthes disease. Otherwise, traditionally, it is called as LCPD, Leg Cow Perthes disease. They have contributed a lot. And if we see about the contribution of these three gentlemen, we should not forget about another three gentlemen. That is from the Waldestrom, he has described the natural history of the Perthes disease. The Anthony Cattrall has from the United Kingdom, and he was popular for almost half of a century for the, his classification and head at risk sign. And person from the Texas Cortis Wright Hospital, uh, Tony Herring, has described the classification. And it was uh, the big questions from the most of the Indian examiner, Cattrall and Harding classification to be included. Uh, I should always mention the person from India, that is Dr. Benjamin Joseph. And uh, this is the picture from the book uh, the, by the Dennis Wenger. And he has mentioned also the one of the largest series of the Perthes disease in world. And he has contributed a lot about the natural evolution of disease by the modis, uh, modified Elizabeth classification. And in the 19th and 20th century, if you are talking about the Perthes disease, the lecture or discussion would be inadequate or not finished unless we'll mention about the Dr. Benjamin's name or contribution in the Perthes disease. Let us come to the topic, what is the Perthes disease? It's a very, very important to understand the definition. It's an idiopathic self-limiting avascular necrosis of the capital femoral epiphysis. Whenever there is an avascular necrosis happens, that is self-limiting in nature in a child, it is called as Perthes disease. Why this definition is very, very relevant? Because if we see the avian falling trauma, DDH treatment, sickle cell anemia, it would not be considered as a Perthes disease. Many people will say avian in child is Perthes disease. No. It is always idiopathic in nature. It is always self-limiting in nature. What is self-limiting? Avian is followed by the revascularization. Then only it is called as the Perthes disease. So in a real sense, when we see about the X-ray, it is happening about the, the density of the capital femoral epiphysis will be affected because of the AVN. And as the disease progress that the AVN will be followed by the revascularization. So the density of the bone regain it into normal. So it is very, very simple. Anything is dense, it looks radiopaque on X-ray. So that is a cardinal sign of the Perthes disease on the radiograph. If person is not familiar with the radiograph, they can only understand whenever the density of the capital femoral epiphysis is affected, the mole sclerosis is present. That is a self-limiting and 
idiopathic in nature that is active for this disease. What happened during the process of time, the AVN would be followed by revascularization. So it, the density of the femoral head will become the normal and that is called as the Hildeperthes disease. In other sense, whenever the density is more, that is called as the active Perthes disease. The density regained to the normal, that will be called as the healed Perthes disease. So we need to understand the active Perthes disease and healed Perthes disease. What is the etiology? The etiology of the disease is unknown. So what is the relevance of this sentence? So whenever we will see the density is more, we need to find out the etiology. So we need to rule out infection, inflammation, sickle cell anemia before stamping or before saying in a diagnosis why it is relevant in the postgraduate. So whenever we'll see about the case of suspective for this disease, it is always to be kept as one of the differential diagnoses for the postgraduate examination. What is the epidemiology? Because of the strange reason, it is very, very common in the southwest of the India. And compared to the, the Western world, it is not very common in the crowded city. If you see in a Western world where in the Scandinavian country and London, it is very common in a crowded city. But the epidemiology of the Perthes in India is a little different than the Western world. And as I said, that is very common in the West Coast, Southwest Coast, and it was proven in some of the studies that the incidence was much higher in the West Coast from the Panvel to the Trivendram compared to the Eastern part of India. What is the relevance of this point? If the child from five to 12 years of age comes from this belt, always keep in mind as a Perthes, as a differential diagnosis with the hip pain, if a patient or the child comes from the northern part of India, tuberculosis is one of the common differential diagnoses. So always keep in mind when you are dealing with the patient. What are the clinical futures when you can say about suspect of the Perthes hip? Traditionally, many teachers it teach that there is a painless limp is one of the common features in a Perthes disease, but that would not be true Parthis can present with the painful limb as well as the painless limb. But the most common would be the limb would be insidious in onset. It would not be acute in onset. But the hallmark of the Parthis disease would be a restriction of the range of motion. Among the, all the range of motion, the commonest being is the abduction and internal rotation. It is very common in the boys and very common between the five years to 12 years. But epidemiologically, it will be older in the Indian scenario compared to the Western world. Western world will have the age of onset of disease would be little bit early than the Indian scenario. When we see about the age of onset in Indian patient, it would be little higher than the Western world. When we compare about the Frequency, why it is relevant? Because any child between five years to 12 years with hip joint, whether there's painless hip or the painful limb, we need to keep the Perthes disease as a one of the differential diagnostic. As I said, for the physical examination, very important aspect, the most of the children will have somehow some restriction of the range of motion and restriction of, of range of motion would be mild to moderate in nature. Very rarely we will see the child with the severe restriction of all range of motion. And among all range of motion, very common to have the passive abduction and internal rotation would be restricted. So whenever child present in the southwest zone between five to 12 years, common in boy, with the abduction and internal rotation would be restricted, that would be more than three weeks, you can suspect about the Perthes disease. There's a cl clinical findings, the abduction would be restricted or internal rotation would be restricted, or sometimes it would be restriction of the both. Very rarely we will find out the flexion would be restricted. Common is the abduction and internal rotation, 
and it will be utilized as the screening test. If you see the cortis is very common, it can be used for the children who are studied in school for the screening who are having Parthis disease or not. What is the evolution of the disease? As I said, the, the avascular necrosis would be followed by the revascularization and that would be complete healing. So whenever the AVN happens in uh, any part of the body, it will be followed by the osteoclastic activity and resorption of the bone. And that is the reason that will cause the fragmentation of the epiphysis and the newborn neovascularization will happen and newborn formation will happen from the anterolateral aspect of the femoral head. So in a broadly, the parties would be classified into the four different stages depend on the evolution of the disease. The stage of the avascular necrosis, stage of the fragmentation, stage of the revascularization and the complete healing depends on the evolution of disease. Similarly, how they progress. It can be detected very easily on the x-ray. I will discuss that one by one. And that is the natural evolution of the disease. That's how the stage of the vascular necrosis, stage of the fragmentation, regeneration, and healed. So that is described in the fourth stage. The first stage being is the stage of the avascular necrosis. It will be further divided into two stage. It's a stage 1A and a stage 1B, but by and large stage 1 is the avascular necrosis where the epiphysis appears dense and then flatten. So whenever it is a stage of the avascular necrosis, the capital femoral epiphysis looks radio dense. So if you can see it would be whiter in the x-ray compared to the density of the metaphysis and soft, but the height would be maintained that is called as a stage 1A. Stage 1B, the difference between stage 1A and 1B, that is a density would be similar, but the height would be reduced, that would be called as a stage 1B. Again, stage 1 is a stage of the avascular necrosis, Stage 1 is maintenance of the height. Stage 1B would be collapse or the reduction of the height. What happened in a stage of the fragmentation that is called as a stage 2 where the epiphysis gets fragmented and that where the maximum collapse happens. This is the stage is very crucial. The maximum deformation of the femoral head happens in stage of the fragmentation. The stage of fragmentation would be divided into two at stage 2A where one or two fissure appear from the subchondral bone towards the physis. It would not be horizontal. Many times, many postgraduates will be confused where we'll see the subchondral fracture line. That would be the gate sign or Wallerstrom sign, but that will be a part of stage one where we'll see about the fragmentation from the subchondral to the physis if there is a single or two fragmentation in ap and frog lateral it is stage 2a when the fragmentation increase more than two it would be considered as stage 2b so whenever there is avn no fragmentation that is stage one whenever there is a avn with the fragmentation it is stage two what happened in stage three where the newborn formation happens from the periphery of the avascular epiphysis and the newborn would be a less denser than the actual avascular necrosis so it would not be looking as as much about the radio dense so whenever we will see any newborn formation or texture of the bone would be less than the density of the epiphysis then that will be giving idea about stage three. And when the newborn formation happens less than one third of the circumference of the epiphysis, it will be only present on the lateral aspect could we cause as the stage 3A. When it will be covering more than the one third, it will be called as stage 3B. 
again i will see the blue mark is there where the density would not be as much as the central part it will be covering more than one third to two third that would be called as a stage of regeneration or a stage of the revascularization in stage 3a less than one third and stage 3b more than one third of the periphery of the epiphysis when the process of the revascularization and repair would be complete and there would not be evidence of the avascular bone in epiphysis it would be called as the healed stage as i said in beginning the density of the epiphysis would be looking exactly like a metaphysis that would be considered as a stage four so if you see the entire process of the natural history it will take around two to four years and when we studied every stage will follow few months three months to six months in duration but maximum period would be passed in the stage of the fragmentation and the stage of the revascularization it varies from the child to child it varies from the age to age from the boys and girls but the same it would be classified what we discuss up to stage one that is the avascular necrosis where the height is maintained where the stage of the in late stage of the avascular necrosis where the height is reduced and that is stage 1a and stage 1b where there is a fissure is appearing from the subchondral bone to that we can see on a single fissure that would be called as stage of early fragmentation then fissure it will be more than two that would be called as the advanced stage of the fragmentation or a late stage of fragmentation when we see about the the density on the lateral aspect that will give idea there would be new bone formation present that is called as early stage of revascularization or stage 3a when there is a, the revascular process would be covering more than one third it will try to cover that would be called as the late stage of regeneration and if you see in the last part the density from the first part would be radio dense in the last it will disappear the density the density will remain the same that would be called as a heel stage so this classification will be very very important and be classified by dr benjamin joseph and he gave the name is modified elizabeth town depends on the original classification of the waldestrom and elizabeth town but what is the relevance of this classification yes it follows the natural history of the disease but as we have seen from the natural history in 620 cases the maximum deformation happens and stage of the advanced fragmentation so if we want to do about the treatment strategy we need to catch these children before stage of advanced fragmentation the treatment strategy would be different if child present early it will be different if child presents late and it would be entirely different than they present in the heel stage and that is the relevance of this classification because that will decide whether to do about the preventive measure whether to do the corrective measure or whether to do about the salvage measure healing process will take two to four years and the commonest question would be asked by the many people including lemon that if there is the disease is self-limiting in nature why need to treat these cases why need to treat the purchase disease the answer is there uh, during uh, the process of the revascularization or during a process of the natural evolution of disease the femoral head may get deformed it may lead to the the bigger femoral head that is called as the coxa magna the shorter neck that would be called as the coxa breva or the last side the right side is that the irregular femoral head it would be called as the coxa irregularis the femoral head would be like the clay toys that we can change into the shape of the femoral head in stage of the fragmentation where the weight bearing forces can change the shape of the femoral head and that is a main aim of treating a person's disease to prevent the femoral head deformation maintain the normal spherical 
femoral head shape. And if you see the outcome of the parties in untreated older child, that 80% of the patient without the treatment, without any intervention, that loses the spherical shape of the femoral head. And that if we know about, if you lose about the spherical femoral head, it can lead to the early degenerative secondary osteoarthritis of the hip in early adulthood. I will come back to that point on when discuss about the Stolper classification, but the goal of the Perthes disease to prevent all these. If we can prevent all these, we would be successful in getting about good outcome of the patient at the heel stage. When we are discussing about the radiology of the parties, we need to discuss the two important aspects of the radiological classification in parties disease. And these are the very common favorite question and some of the examiner, what are the cattle classification and the herring classification? At the outset, I will say that the both classification would be relevant only in active stage of disease and both would be relevant only in a stage of the fragmentation. Again, I will repeat that whenever we do about the, see the outcome of disease, if we wait till the stage of the advanced fragmentation, it would be very late. So the both classification would have relevance on the prognosis of the outcome of the disease, but both are not utilized for the decision making of the treatment of disease. So what is the cattle classification? Cattle describe about the extent of the involvement when there is a group one, there is less than half is involved, the group two is a half epiphysis is involved, group three more than half is involved, and group four is entire epiphysis is involved. In other sense, if you want to remember that, we can say in easy way, 25 percentage, 50 percentage, 75 percentage, and 100 percent. So we can divide into one, two, three, four. At the outset, I will say that in Indian children, we don't see very frequently cattral one and two. And obviously, less head involvement, good prognosis, more head involvement would be a poorer prognosis. So we do see the cattral three and four more frequently than the Western world. This classification is based on the extent of the involvement, so it will be utilized by the cattle for the prognosis and the planning of the treatment, but it will be too late to do both the cattle system in the stage of the advanced fragmentation. The another classification in 1993, the herring from the Texas Cortis has kept in the stage of the fragmentation came with the lateral pillar. He divided the epiphysis in three parts, central part, medial part, and lateral part. And that's how the lateral classification, lateral pillar classification come. Is divided into the three group, A, B, C, when there is a loss of the height would not be present, it would call as a group A. When there is a 50%, less than 50% loss of height, it would be called as a group B. And more than 50% would be called as group C. So whenever the herring came, the, when the lateral pillar height is maintained, it will be called as group A. When the half, more than half is involved, then that is a group C. Later, the herring has added B bar C, that is exactly at the 50%, that's added is that B bar C in his lateral pillar classification. Again, the lateral pillar classification would be utilized only in stage of fragmentation. In early stage of disease, you cannot classify by the herring classification. The classification will have the value for the predicting the prognosis when the lateral height is maintained and that is a sense for making the classification when the lateral height of the lateral pillar has been maintained, it will be associated with the good outcome. When the lateral pillar is severely involved like C, it would be associated with the poor outcome. And that is the reason we need to do about the three classification till now, modified Elizabeth classification, cattle classification, and herring classification. 
The fourth classification is the Sturber classification, but it will be useful only after the disease will be healed. That is a prognostic classification. It says from one to five, but once the disease is healed, ideally it should be useful at the skeletal maturity to predict whether this hip is going to last forever or not. So whenever we evaluate the outcome of disease, we need to apply about the Stuhlberg classification. The pros graduate must remember which classification would be useful when. In active stage of disease, there is a Cattrall and Herring classification, the natural history of disease, modified Elizabeth classification, and heal disease at the end of the disease. When we see the case after five years following it, what is disease, you can apply about the Stuber classification. What is Stuber classification? It says from one to five, and one is associated with excellent outcome, while five is called as the worst outcome. We'll see one by one. One is that is absolutely normal. We cannot find out whether the right or left Parthi's child was there. It looks identical in nature. It will last forever. The ideally, we can get about outcome of disease like this. It would be excellent, but we may not get that. What is the Stuhlberg? When Itesh, you are muted. Uh -huh. Sorry. Yeah. Whenever there is a milder coxa magna or the milder coxa breva, when neck length is uh, the short or the head is bigger, it will be, but the sparicity is maintained, that is called as the Stuttberg 2. So 1 and 2 is sparical and congruent. Only difference between 1 and 2 is there would be coxa magna and breva, but that is a sparical congruency will be maintained. What is the Stuhlberg 3? When there is the, the sparicity would not be equal that. We can see the diameter in the AP and lateral view would be different. So it will be the shape of the femoral head is like an egg shape. It looks in a spherical in one view. It just looks spherical in other view. But when we compare about AP diameter and lateral diameter, it looks like an umbrella or egg shape. And that is called as the, again, that is a spherical and congruent, but that is a Stuhlberg 3. That will be considered as a Stuhlberg 3. Stuhlberg 4 and 5 are the aspherical, where we can have the, the flattening of the, the femoral head. We can see that is compared to the right side, the left side is flattened, but the acetabulum follow almost same. So the congruency has been maintained. So that would be a Stuhlberg 4. What is Stuhlberg 5, where there would not be any congruency and the irregularity of the femoral head, that would be a Stuhlberg 5. What is the usefulness of this classification? Stuhlberg 1 will last forever. Stuhlberg 2 will have the osteoarthritis in fifth decade. Stuhlberg 3 will have the osteoarthritis in fourth decade. Stuhlberg 4 will have third decade and Stuhlberg 5 will have in second to third decade. So as far as possible, we can avoid the Stuhlberg 5. Few points on the pathogenesis of the femoral head deformity. Why the femoral head deformity happens? Because of the vascular insert, the epiphysis becomes the radiodense. The body will have mechanism to have the increase the vascularity around the avascular necrosis. So there would be reactive synovitis. There is a reactive blood supply of the cartilage, femoral cartilage and acetabular cartilage would be increased. And this all can lead to the femoral head extrusion. So whenever there is an AVN, that would be associated synovitis, hypertrophy, associated with the muscle spasm of the adductor and hip will go in adduction that can lead to the femoral head extrusion. And if the femoral head extrusion happens, the avian area would be subjected to the weight bearing forces and muscular forces. And the stress would be applied at the acetabular margin at the newborn and stage 2b to 3a that can lead to the femoral head deformation. I will show you some example. Commonest being in a parties, 
because it is involving on anterolateral aspect that is very common on the AV and because of the reactive, the vascularity, synovitis, the ligamentum teres, hypertrophy, capsular thickening, articular cartilage thickening, acetabular cartilage thickening, adductor spasm, we can see the head is getting it out. That is called as term extrusion or in others, Term, simple term would be called as a subluxation of the hip joint. When that will be subluxation, there is an AVN and the weight bearing forces will happen at the anterolateral aspect of the acetabulum and that can lead to the femoral head deformation. This is one of the examples that is an extrusion and the femoral head. We can see there is an irreversible femoral head deformation happens due to the extrusion. And that would be measured by the Remus migration index. The important message, the femoral head extrusion and irreversible deformation happens in the stage of the late fragmentation or advanced fragmentation in a stage to be so if we want to do anything we need to do before this stage so what is the objective or the goals of the Perthes treatment the prevention of the femoral deformation and in long run prevention of the secondary osteoarthritis so if we divide into the goal in detail we need to maintain the sparsity of the femoral head we need to prevent the greater trochanteric overgrowth if the child present early before the stage of the advanced fragmentation, we need to use have the preventive goal. If the child present following a stage of the advanced fragmentation, that is irreversible femoral shape would be distorted. So we need to correct the about consequences of the altered size and shape of the femoral head. If child present in a late stage, we need to the option or the aim of the treatment for the salvage or the relieve the pain. So when we see about the natural history of the Perthes disease, if child if it say that irreversible femoral head deformation in the stage of the fragmentation, if the child comes in stage of the AVN, in early AVN or late AVN or early fragmentation, the preventive intervention would be justified. If the child present in a stage of the lead fragmentation or early reconstitution, the remedial or corrective measure would be required for child present beyond the stage 3B or later in case of the hill stages required to have the salvage surgery. And that's how this classification is very, very useful. It has been taken into consideration by the International Party Study Group. And this classification is useful across the world. So we'll discuss one by one what is a preventive measure, remedial measure, and the salvage measure. Let us start on the preventive measure. Preventive measure means we are talking in a stage of the avian or early fragmentation. So how to decide about the treatment? The all the all kids, all children do not require surgical intervention. Same way, all children do not require non-operative intervention there are the various factors various variables to be considered for the treatment planning what are those the age of onset of disease i repeat the onset of disease when the child having the symptoms not the age of presentation the stage of disease again i said in stage of the avian or the early fragmentation the extent of the artificial involvement if it is half or more than half Presence of artificial extrusion and range of motion. We'll discuss one by one. The child age is divided in less than five, more than 12. Less than five would be associated with good outcome. More than 12 would be separate entity called as the adolescent birthdays. Five to 12 is still controversy across the world. But in short, less than five, good outcome, more than 12, poor outcome, five to 12 is still a lot of dilemma. Prognosis is poor in adolescent and prognosis is very, very good in a younger age group. The older it's a child associated with the poor the outcome. How the extent of the involvement as 
described by the Cattrell, less than half would be associated with good outcome, more than half is associated with the poor outcome. The presence of the epiphyseal extrusion and the study said whenever there is more than 20% of extrusion, it would be associated with poor outcome. So we need to prevent the 20 degree or more extrusion in any stage of the disease. The range of motion, whether the range of motion has been restored or whether range of motion is limited. A range of motion is one of the important factor which will decide about the treatment. If you want to justify any intervention by the surgical, either the femoral or acetabulum, you should not embark any surgery when the range of motion is restricted. The femoral osteotomy or acetabular osteotomy is justified only the range of motion have been gained to the normal. So how the decision making would be useful by considering about the, all the factors we'll discuss. Less than five, as I said, it will associated with the good outcome. The most of these kids doesn't require any surgical intervention at any time. The non-operative containment in term of the bracing, you need to require the board abduction braces and it is easy to maintain the abduction brace in children less than five years. The five to seven years depends on that what is the extent of involvement and extrusion. If there is an extrusion present between the five to seven years, they will require about the surgical containment. And seven to 12 years, when we learn that the natural history in this older patient, it will be always associated with poor outcome. In early stage of disease, we need to do about containment before extrusion happens. The extent of the involvement, if less than half, it will require no containment. More than half will require containment. Again, I will repeat, we don't see the children less than half epiphysis involved. We do have cases more than half involvement. The stage of disease, the early presentation, we need to have a containment. The containment will not have same role as early stage of the disease as in late stage of disease. If we need to do about containment, we need to do in early stage of disease. In late stage of disease, we might lose or the, miss the boat in that because we have proven in the study, the chances of getting a spherical femoral head is good if we do in early stage of disease. If there is internal rotation and abduction is restricted, do not consider for containment. In those cases, very commonly, it will be kept in exam. Do not jump and say when the range of motion is restricted, this child will require the surgery. The simplest option is to gain the range of motion by keeping a few days of the skin traction. Always keep in mind whenever range of motion is restricted, regain the range of motion before embarking the surgical containment. Reassess the interrotation and abduction after a few days of traction. If it is still restricted, you need to think about something else like broomstick cast. Normally, most of these kids, we can gain the good range of motion after five to seven days of the skin traction. Less than 10 percentage of the children will require about the broomstick cast for the six weeks. Always consider the range of motion is very important variable. Do not do surgery when the range of motion are restricted. Always do surgery after the range of motion has been restored to be normal. What are the surgery? That is called as the containment surgery and trochanteric epiphysiodesis. There are two surgery, femoral containment and the acetabular containment. There are option. It will be asked by the some of the examiner why femur. It is easy, no risk of the any injury and no intraarticular pressure increase compared to the acetabulum. And there is evidence that we can able to bypass the stage of the fragmentation if we do the femoral containment. The lecture would not be finished if you don't mention about the pelvic containment because in the Western world, many people do the Salter or the self osteotomy. It will be having advantage. There would not be any shortening, no change in liver arm, no verticalization of the abdominal plate and no second surgery will recur if you do about the 
fall with contained demand. But we do about the virus derotation or pseudomy by the containment surgery. And if the internal rotation is restricted, we can do about the virus extension or pseudomy. It's required about the 20 degree and literature says 15 to 20 degree of virus is adequate with 20 degree derotation. Associated, we have to do about trochanteric epiphyseal disease in order to prevent the greater trochanteric overgrowth. How does it work? The anterolateral part of the femoral head is involved. That will be subject for the weight bearing forces and that can lead to the femoral deformation. So it can be reduced under the acetabulum if we abduct and interrotate the hip. So what is a surgical containment? We do about the abduction and interrotation of the proximal fragment then cut about the distal fragment and align it to the neutral and derotate that is the virus and derotate externally that is the virus derotation osteotomy so in order when you do about virus of 20 degree you can gain the abduction of the proximal fragment of 20 degree so where the anterolateral part would be covered under acetabular when you derotate the 20 degree externally, the proximal fragment will go 20 degree internal rotation. That is a very easy. We can do about the trochanteric epiphyseal disease by drilling and keeping the first screw across the physis. So this is an example of the virus extension osteotomy. We can see that the extension has been achieved by the 20 degree that will be opening. The opening doesn't require any bone grafting. So when we say in one slide, how the decision making will happen, the age more than seven will invariably will require about the containment less than seven without any extrusion, doesn't require containment. The extent of epiphyseal involvement is more than 50%. It will require the containment. Stage of disease one or two A, it will require the containment. Extrusion is present in younger age and always consider the range of motion. So these are the very important facts, the age of onset of disease, extent of epiphyseal involvement, the stage of evolution of disease, extrusion, and range of motion. Few examples, the five-year-old child presented with the Perthes disease. We can see the left side is Perthes disease. It's been treated non-operative at end of the healing after 12 years. The child has got the good outcome, the Stuhlberg outcome, Stuhlberg 1. Another child present with the six years where the, stay, the age of is less than seven years when there is no extrusion. When you see about Riemer's migration index, so the child has been serially followed. But still after the six month, the extrusion has not happened. The stage of advanced fragmentation happens. After one year, we can able to see the lateral part. It is getting gained. Two years, the range of motion has been maintained. After five years, we can see the spherical congruent hip compared to the normal side. We cannot find out whether the left or right part this disease was there. Another example, the six-year-old child, there is a flattening and there is an extrusion. So what should we do here? In the six years, the age of the disease, the age of the onset is six years. But when we measure the extrusion, it is 35% and it is in stage of the late AVN. So the child required the virus derotation osteotomy. And this is the outcome where if you are not done, would have gone for the deformation of the femoral head. We gain the normal spherical congruent hip at the healing at the five years of the age. The older child in the early stage of the AVN, but even though we know about natural history of disease, this child will require Strange away the surgery virus derotation osteotomy in early stage of disease. If we follow it three months to nine months to 12 months, it will follow the different stage. Now you can see that it's stage 3B. The remodeling or the revascularization happens from the lateral aspect, but it is not complete after 30 months. There is an avian has disappeared. It's gone up for the heel stage and its skeletal maturity. We can see that good articular trochanteric distance with the spherical congruent hip at the skeletal maturity. Similarly, the early stage of fragmentation in older age group, the half epiphysis is involved, treated with the video and good spherical 
congruent hip. I like to add one more point is that what is the role of the trochanteric epiphyseal disc is if you see that the whenever we do the varus derotation osteotomy trochanter used to migrate it up so, so always consider about trochanteric epiphyseal disease and it works very well up to the 10 years of age in more than 50 percentage of the cases so whenever we do about the varus derotation osteotomy always combined with the prophylactic trochanteric epiphyseal disease and this is one of the example the article of trochanteric distance it be comparable to the both side at the skeletal maturity. Few controversy, I am not going in detail, but the people have not found the answer whether weight relief is good or not. Everybody will have their own strategy. Non-operative treatment will be comparable with surgical reserve, femoral or acetabular. But virtually there is no level one evidence to answer this question. I mention it here because the many institutions will have different, different protocols for treating about the Perthes disease. So the person must be aware what is the controversy. In short, they can find out or they can say virtually there is no level one evidence showing one is better than the other, whether it's a weight relief. There are studies are going on and probably in one decade, we will have the answer for all this controversy. That is a preventive. Ideally, the role of the uh, goal of the pathi should be preventive. If the child present in a late stage of disease, what should we do? We need to have a remedial intervention. What are the problems when they present in the late stage of disease? We don't have control that when child can present in early stage of disease, they can present in a late stage of disease. So what are the issues that extrusion with pro progressive deformation of the femoral head and the hinge abduction? So whenever the child present in advanced stage of the fragmentation, we need to think about the two issue, major issue, extrusion and the hinge abduction. So how to find out what should we do for the both for that? Whether can we do about containment surgery but the chances of getting about the containment is very, very less in advanced stage of fragmentation. As we say, the 17 times less than compared to the early stage of disease. And second issue is the hinge abduction. What is the hinge abduction? Many times it would be questioned from the examiner how to find out the hinge abduction. In a clinical sense, Whenever the range of motion is severely restricted in advanced stage of fragmentation, you can think about the hinge abduction. Hinge abduction is ideally detected by the plane radiograph, plane abduction radiograph. So we can see about how to differentiate between the normal abduction and hinge abduction. This is on left side is normal abduction on the right side is the hinge abduction. So what is the difference between the normal abduction and the hinge abduction? When we see about the center of the rotation or the center of the abduction happens at the center of the femoral head in normal abduction, where the abduction in the hinge abduction happens at the margin of the acetabulum. And second commonest difference between the hinge abduction and normal abduction when we see about the joint space would be uniform in case of the normal abduction wide in hinge abduction if the medial joint space is widened and crescentically more compared to the normal abduction so whenever we see the left side of picture in abduction view that is the normal abduction. Whenever we'll see uh, this kind of picture, that would be the hinge abduction. Why need to detect the hinge abduction? So whenever we'll see hinge abduction, that is the contraindication of doing about the varus derotation osteotomy. So in late stage of disease, what is our goal to find out whether the child has got hinge abduction or not? If you embark the 
what is derotation osteotomy rather than helping the child it may be harmful for the child so you should not do the what is derotation osteotomy so again i said it happened in advanced stage of fragmentation it would be associated with remarkable reduction of the range of motion and it will give idea about the femoral head deformation so if you cannot find out the hinge abduction in the plane radiograph you can see the medial pulling of die by doing about arthrogram but it is very well detected by the plane radiograph what is the treatment of the hinge abduction it will require valgus osteotomy self osteotomy or a chiari osteotomy so the post collapse when the child present in the late stage of fragmentation first and foremost to find out whether the hinge abduction is present or absent if hinge abduction is present you should never do about valgus derotation osteotomy it will require valgus osteotomy or self or chiari to increase the coverage to gain the congruency of the hip if the hinge abduction is absent we see that whether the femoral head is enlarged or not if femoral head is enlarged it will not go inside by the varus derotation osteotomy it will require to get coverage by the self acetabuloplasty if it is hinge abduction is absent with no coxa magna still you can do about the varus derotation osteotomy but the sparsity of getting is very very less whenever there is a hinge abduction is present this is ideal case for the valgus osteotomy you can do about the valgus osteotomy or it can be treated here the hinge abduction is present medial pulling of die you can do about the chiari osteotomy or this is you can do about the self osteotomy self procedure for that but important message whenever there is hinge abduction is present or the stage of that one fragmentation the chances of getting the good outcome in the stulberg 1 and 2 are very very less compared to the early stage of disease few points on the salvage surgery when should we do that if the child present in the late stage of the healing or the full heal stage that may be the ill if the child may be present with the bigger head that is called as coxa magna the smaller neck that is called as coxa breva or irregular femoral head that is coxa irregularis and all can lead to the mechanical mal alignment like trochanteric overgrowth functional coxa vara big femoral head that can lead to the stress across the hip joint or irregularity and these are the recent advances in the puppy's disease there are many enthusiasm across the world to correct the consequences or the sequelae of the for this disease if the trochanter is higher and the neck is short that is called as the coxa breva and if you see about the abduction it can lead to the extra articular impingement it is not the intra articular shape of the femoral it is good but because of the trochanter is impinging on the acetabulum or the pelvis the range of motion would be restricted so it will require the correction so what is a coxa breva when there is a femoral neck is short there are the three different option traditional lateral and distalized that tracker greater trochanter that is greater trochanteric transfer or relative neck lengthening or absolute neck lengthening this simple example cut the the trochanter and distal and lateralize the trochanter this is the schematic presentation by the dirin bai he has put that cut the femur the trochanter and do about the transfer distal and lateral transfer on that what is the relative neck lengthening you cut the trochanter central part you excise and fix with that so the neck become longer that is the relative neck lengthening this is the example where there is the coxa brevis is there and neck lengthening happens that you can see the neck length has gained back to the normal compared to the pre op x ray say the neck and what is the third that is absolute neck lengthening or the moscus osteotomy cut the head and cut on the lower part of the the neck cutting between the upper part and lower part and lateral and distalize the shaft that is the neck lengthening this is one of the example to have the 
natural and distillation of the stuff to gain. So what is the indication of the Moschker sostratomy compared to the relative neck lengthening when it would be associated with the shortening more than two centimeter? You can do about the Moschker sostratomy on that. But reserve this all this option whenever we'll have the spherical or ovoid head because the long-term outcome would not be associated with the greater trochanteric overgrowth. It would be associated with the sparicity of femoral head. Don't do this surgery when you will have the irregular femoral head. So what should we do when there is a coxa magna or bigger head or the coxa irregular is you can do about the osteochondroplasty for the impingement or the Gans osteotomy. Like this is the sparicity of the femoral head has been lost when it's required to do the osteochondroplasty and the safe surgical dislocation and greater trochanteric transfer. Or there will be GANS reduction osteotomy. What is it? There is a femoral head reduction osteotomy. If you see the central part of the femoral head is irregular in a frog lateral. So when you see that is spherical, the medial side is spherical. So we can able to cut about the central part and utilize the lateral fragment and middle fragment and join it together to gain about the sparicity that is called as the femoral head reduction GANS osteotomy. It is a complicated procedure, but the outcome of this surgery, we don't know about the long-term outcome. In the safest hand, the conversion rate in total hip replacement is 30 to 50 percentage. So we don't know about the long-term outcome of this surgery, but postgraduate can write in that exam recent advances in the Pertis disease. What are the options in irreversible osteoarthritis or the hip pain? It may be the femoral head reshaping, hip arthrodesis, pelvic support osteotomy, or total joint replacement depends on socioeconomic background of the patient, depends on the culture of the patient. I will conclude today the parthis is a self-limiting disorder. It's idiopathic in nature. So whenever we'll have a self-limiting AVN that is idiopathic in nature, it is a parthis disease, very common in Southwest India. Easy to diagnose by two range of motion, abduction and interrotation would be restricted. The plain A radiograph is the diagnostic, the sclerosis and the Collapse is the cardinal sign in the Parthis disease. It will be there in every case with the active stage of Parthis disease. Both sclerosis would be absent in the heel stage of disease. That's how you can differentiate between active stage of disease. The goal of treatment of the Parthis disease is prevention in nature. Femoral head deformation should be prevented and containment is the one of the surgery in the Parthis disease. And if you want to do about the containment, it should be done in early stage of disease. Thank you. I will end this talk here. If any question, you are most welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Tess, sir. Uh, any resident having any queries, please proceed. Anybody? Okay, so uh, Hitesh sir, thank you very much. Okay, but, but, ah, yeah. yes, proceed, yes, proceed. Uh, so, good evening, sir. Sir, yeah. I have a few questions to ask, sir. Uh, yeah. uh, sir, uh, you were supposed to talk like what else with the uh, non-operative treatment, like the conservative management, sir. Uh, would you please tell us like uh, non uh, what would be the non-operative management in the yeah. like uh, the, yeah. Yeah, non-operative management is the whenever it is asked in exam, you can start with the skin traction. When you say about range of motion is restricted, you can give the skin traction. Second non-operative treatment, range of motion is not getting better. You can do about the broomstick cast. The third non-operative treatment, when is younger child to maintain the range of motion is the physiotherapy. The fourth non-operative management is you do treat the permanently with the fixed abduction brace that is called as the braces in treatment of the Parthis disease and the fifth and the foremost 
non operative treatment is non weight bearing with the crutches these are the different non weight bearing option for the crutches disease okay sir another question sir uh, while putting the traction sir we always like put on the normal limb also in the abduction yeah. so sir could be the reason for that and sir another thing uh, how the mechanism of traction works is just uh, relieve the spasm or some other yes sir yes a very important question i have not addressed but i have put the picture always yes, is always keep the traction on the bilateral the reason is that as you learn in tuberculosis what happen in the stage of synovite is the hip will go in flexion abduction and external rotation correct if you yes. are going to keep the traction in abduction what will happen the child will develop the abduction deformity so the countering the normal side you need to keep always traction on the normal side that is above knee traction with keep the pillow underneath the knee joint so keep the hip into flexion second question what is the role of traction what happen in why in a parthes the the range of motion is restricted because of the muscle spasm if you take the child under anesthesia you will gain the lot of range of motion you will not see any spasm so for the relieving spasm for relieving or giving the joint rest and giving the analgesic effect traction would be effective so when the range of motion is restricted always give a good traction okay uh, so one more thing uh, you are uh, told about the stages like the natural development of the disease so and you said uh, mostly by 2 years Uh, the entire cycles get complete and may uh, if things go well uh, the patient will heal so what what about the in between stages time period is it fixed or sir it varies from patient to patient it varies from the patient to patient it's not always 2 years it varies from 21 months to 60 months but in in natural disease when we study it is between 2 years to 4 years okay but the stage of the fragmentation and stage of reconstitution will take a little longer otherwise it is 3 to 6 months each stage will take 3 to 6 months so whenever you will see the child at the stage of the avian why we need to know about staging of disease if we keep the child for non weight bearing we need to know the irreversible deformation happens in the stage of the avian the advanced fragmentation we need not to put the child with the what very heavy activity so we need to avoid the very heavy activity active child in stage of advanced fragmentation okay sir and sir one uh, hinge abduction phenomena you told sir uh, is there any way to uh, clinically see or uh, uh, the stiff will be very stiff like the hip will be very stiff so whenever the the range of motion whenever we will have the the uh, range of motion is restricted severely restricted you can think about the hinge abduction when when the range of motion is normal and suddenly we lose the range of motion then there is a idea about that is a hinge abduction and that happens in advanced stage of fragmentation okay and sir uh, when we do vdro uh, is there a, like uh, when to remove the plate like at maturity because we do, we do trochanteric epiphysodesis also no it doesn't require at uh, because we do about the screw doesn't require at skeletal maturity once disease is healed we can remove the plate okay sir okay hitesh sir thank you very much for your lecture sir thank you very much thank for you. your time and effort sir you made thank it you. Every, uh, very thing clear thank, thank you very much sir shrivansh Yes, yes. Hitesh, can I ask? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are not following uh, Salter Thompson. Uh, it is taken out from the book. No, it is there, but uh, Salter and Thompson, we will see only in thirty percentage of cases. So, for avoiding confusion, I have avoided. Yeah, that's, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> because when we were at the MCH course, that was a classification which was no, very. Because, because if you see the hundred. it's we will get only in 30% of the cases so they will get lost that is reason i have not included only yeah. that classification i have not included sir. i agree i agree secondly <laughs> those children yes sir uh, with whatever you are saying the restriction of movement because of the spasm these are the people what we used to do 
get them under GI, if they have a moment, uh, if the under moment they, you are able to reduce, get the surgery earlier, otherwise this, we used to lo lose them as follow up patients. So ah. that is the reason, uh, if the containment occurs in abduction internal rotation, we used to treat them immediately. Uh, yes, sir. But the whenever the spasm is there, the, uh, the as soon as child will come out of anesthesia, there will sometimes would be spasm would be there. So it's better to do the surgery once we gain the range of motion in order to prevent because the stiffness is the one of the important the prognostic sign. If stiffness would be remain same, the hip will go in adduction and the extrusion will happen despite of the containment. That is the reason we need to do about the range of motion before doing surgery. Okay. Thank you. Yes, there is a question from Yash. Yes. When to do shelf osteotomy? Uh, because it uh, resolved in some months. It resolved. Yeah, Yash. Resolved. Yeah. Resolved. Yes. Uh, sir. Resolved, sir. So we have seen that uh, while doing self osteotomy, sometimes it resolves in like six months follow up or some. Uh, so, sir, what could be the next? Uh, we have to wait for the sequelae to happen to for go for next or what? The, uh, the reason the self osteotomy has been popularized by the UK group, uh, but uh, if we need to see, you need to have the adequate self. If you do the lot of the bone graft. It can lead to the secondary femoroacetabular impingement. So you need to be very optimum on that. The people have started using even the secure self, but I, I don't advocate the secure self. I okay. reserve the self only in the cases where there is an advanced stage of the fragmentation and early stage of reconstitution or the older child where we cannot do about the video then only I do the self. I do self very, very less, less than 2% in kids in video. In okay, Hide, sir. Thank you very much, sir. No, there is, uh, there is another your... question. There is another question. Which classification we will be requiring uh, literal... Uh, literal pillar classification. Lateral view to classify. Which classification uh, will require lateral view for it? Uh, some student has asked. Yeah, that's a yes. The modified Elizabeth. All the all the uh, the classification that among all the classification like uh, the the cattle classification require AP lateral because it is the anterior part, anterior and lateral part, medial spine and entire head involvement. While the herring classification will require only AP view, wide mod modified Elizabeth classification require always to view AP and Okay, sir. Okay. 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 So thank you very much, Itesh, sir. Thank you very much for your time and efforts. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Pachore, sir, and uh, Diren, sir, for your presence, sir. It was a great lecture. I yeah, you. absolutely, sir. You make uh, Parthi's disease everything clear, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Bye. And good night, sir. Good night. Okay. Good night, sir. Good night. Bye, Dish. Good night. Good night. Good night. Yes. Good night, sir. Good night to all, sir. Good night. Good night.